does a connected emergency service look like? What, what, how, how can it be connected? And I guess the next question on that is, you know, we're going to talk about digital. What role does digital and, you know, technology have in helping to create that? I, I mean, even kind of 10 plus years ago, we've had digital connectivity in, in for example, uh, primary PCI heart attack pathways. We've been able to send ECGs and have phone calls with the specialist clinical teams. There have been trials around the use of video um, in stroke assessment uh, and using telemedicine like that uh, and a variety of other areas. So that the, the stuff has been emerging and being able to support collaborative decision making. We've had stuff, uh, again, small pilots where we've been able to send pictures of wounds and burns to burns units to see whether you can bypass that ED and go straight yeah. to a tertiary care unit. Do these and things work? Yeah, and kind of they do and they don't and they kind of ebb and flow and, you know, they start and they stall and, you, you know, they're dependent often on people and the leadership involved at the time. Are they often sort of pilots and even when they do work then they, they don't yeah. never come to fruition? Well, some have been pilots, some have changed as commissioners have changed and hospitals have changed and some are still still in place, but okay. you know, perhaps prevalence of disease, workforce changes and you know, it's different, but it's not, it's not as you might expect it to be a way of life, even though it's proven to be really effective. Um, we've got electronic patient records in pre-hostile care now, but they're not connected to the records systems at the other end, although we've done work, say we, the system's done work creating the standards, but getting the different suppliers and vendors to work together with, you know, an ambulance service that might have 20 hospitals or something like that is a really hard thing. But, you know, slowly, slowly, there is better visibility. So in most EDs, they can have a look at the patient record as it's being completed and they know who's coming to them. But truly connected would be that It'd, there would be dashboards and systems that could show, you know, key vital sign information, early warning score. You know, we should, in an ideal world, this is how I imagine it, you know, patients would already have been triaged before they arrived in yeah. the emergency department mm -hmm. and you'd know exactly where they were going to go. And I know all the things that make that not possible, not least the fact that there's never any room at the inn and actually the only place is either outside the department or in the corridor. Mm. So there is an argument to say that if we improve the emergency services end, that can have a knock-on effect and that it can improve the, you know, the lack of beds that are available in hospital further down the route. Because there are a lot of people that end up being admitted to hospital that actually perhaps didn't need to be admitted in the first place. And there are people who, because they don't end up in the right bit of the hospital with the right team at the beginning, may end up staying in hospital for longer than they should have or even, you know, dare we say, have worse outcomes and therefore have a prolonged stay. So there is an argument to say that if we fix that emergency services pre-hospital and initial care, then it's going to fix or help to improve the rest of it. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, um, I think that the, the opportunity for digital is helping the whole system work together as one. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like I'm not answering your question, but, but I am, I promise. Uh, at the moment, we've got a fractured system where people operate in silos. Everyone is glad when, when the patient or service user is not needing their service and they can find the care from another because they're under pressure yeah. uh, or they, they're scared about taking on risk around areas that they don't understand or it seems like it's better for the patient. Um, and, you, you know, even in the big hospitals, it looks like to me, oftentimes the emergency department is isolated from the rest of the hospital yeah. and certainly isolated from, from social care. But if we, if we focus down on the area that I think I know most about, which is, um, which is you, know, you know, that kind of emergency service space, I, I can think of the times where I have worked with colleagues who said, oh, let's just take this person to ED because the minor injuries unit never accept them or I just never get through to that GP practice. There's no point in even having a conversation. And I know what they'll say when I speak to them. Yeah. They'll be, why are you, why are you talking to me? Yeah. They've got this or they've got that. Um, and they need to go to the emergency department. And the sense is that, the sense that you get sometimes is that everyone's trying to avoid 
taking back ownership of a patient. You're nodding, it sounds yeah. like you feel the same. Yeah. Um, or they're reluctant to take on risk. Um, what we need is to use technology um, and we need to do training and education right from undergraduate um, and on an ongoing basis so that we can benchmark and understand what each other do. So I've got reasonable expectations of you as a GP, you've got reasonable expectations of me, I've got reasonable expectations of the, you know, the emergency department, the minor injuries unit, the mental health crisis team. And by doing that and then starting to work together proactively around patients in real time, I think we can make better decisions. And an example of that could be you attend a 999, I attend a 999 call for someone who's fallen out of bed. It's so common. Um, and I don't know anything about that person. But actually, when I look into their record, I discover that they're about to start an end of life care plan because their cancer's reached the point where the multi professional team looking after them are about to start the end of life care medicines and stuff like that. But they haven't had the family conversation yet. Yeah. If I could have that knowledge before I walk in, yeah. it means that I can think, well, do I need to take this person to the hospital because they've got possible fractured hip or, yeah. you, you know, I, you, you understand, you yeah, get it. Yeah, totally, um, 100%. Really good and effective conversation would be, you, you know, whether that's from internal supervision, mm. from, you, uh, I say supervision, I mean clinical practice, colleagues, working with a colleague, you know, call, phone a friend. Yeah. Is it one of my paramedic colleagues who's, got an interest in end-of-life care or is it me having a conversation with the end-of-life care team or the GP to be able to make better informed decisions means that you can treat people with more kindness compassion give them the right outcomes and then not take them to a place which will be bad for them bad for the system um, that's what connected is for me and and just hearing you it, say yeah. that I have to say my reflection on that is that that is not rocket science that is simple that is with the digital capabilities that we currently have, you know, that sounds really straightforward. Yeah, but but wouldn't it be, it, of course it sounds straightforward. I mean, we've been able to, you know, banks have worked together for many years digitally, <laughs> the, the travel industry, yeah. just not healthcare. But it, it, alongside the digital changes, which are hard and easy, we also have to have a practice change and a leadership change and a workforce change where people want to work together, people want to help each other and they collect their knowledge and expertise around the needs of people, understanding that the benefits for the greater good are good for everyone, everything, the system. And there are so many examples where that could work. So for me, again, connected healthcare means connecting the workforce. How do we get what I had in a physical presence and use mm. digital to support that. So how yeah. do you get the wise brain of your colleague um, next to you when you need to ask them a question? For how you, you walk through your, you, you say, hold on to that a moment, David, I'm just gonna go and have a chat with a colleague because I just want to ask their thoughts on it. Yeah. And you go and tap on the door and wait yeah. for them and you have that chat in the corridor yeah. or they come in and have a look at the patient with you. It doesn't yeah. happen that often, mm -hmm. but when you need it, you have it. So how can we do that with digital? Well, that's a good question. And I think we can do it. At, a, at the most simplest way, it's, it's a telephone call or mm. a data phone call or you know, voice call, sorry. But that needs to be in parallel with being able to see all the information. So if I ring you up and you're a paramedic colleague, it would be really cool for me to say, hey, I'd just like to ask you about this patient. You click a button, you can see what I can see, not just you know, potentially the patient, but certainly all the physiological measurements yeah. and the stuff that I've clerked and written down or whatever. And then I say, what have I missed? You know, or it could be, it could be, and I, I can remember a case where uh, a little girl had fallen off a trampoline and, and she had a supracondylar fracture. But I didn't know what a supracondylar fracture is. I'm not an orthopaedic surgeon, yeah. don't work in ED. You know, it's one of those things that you're just not taught. You can't be taught everything in your undergraduate would, would training. It, and, would, it and, be, would it be too far out of this world to therefore think of a scenario where you could patch through an orthopedic, could you patch through one of your paramedic colleagues? Well, you could patch through an orthopaedic surgeon who could make a assessment or a triage of that patient at well, that moment well let me tell you what ambulance. I did do because I had a funny feeling that I didn't know what I was looking at I rang the local minor injuries unit and spoke to a colleague who I'd worked with for years who is the triage nurse practitioner in minor injuries and I said can I just talk this patient through with you and in those days they had enough time to be able to talk 
and he said, look for this, check for this and do that. And I was like, yeah, no, it all seems fine. Uh, he said, oh, fine, bring her in. Got to the department. By that point, the bone was sticking through, you know, and risking risking the, the nerves and vessels that you, you wouldn't want to. But that would be better if it was systematized and yeah. you could... You just you press could, a button. Correct. You could press a button um, and you could find a way of being patched in to someone who can give you that advice and give you that support. But it, it's also about... How do you, so if you're a consultant paramedic leading a team of specialists in an ambulance service, how do you get support to the frontline clinicians, the newly qualified paramedics, the non-registrant crews uh, in a way that isn't obtrusive, that supports them, doesn't feel like Big Brother? And doesn't feel like you're asking them to do more, but correct, actually... But helps them be safe, helps yeah. them learn. And yeah, tech can definitely do that with voice and video and being able to see stuff. So David, I guess if we've kind of discussed what we think a connected emergency service is and how that looks, how far along are we? How much work have we still got left to do? And, and what reasons do you think there are for us not being there already? Yeah, OK. So I, 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 there, there are three, three things. We need to plan to do things differently, not do what we've always done in, in pre hostile land, that's being focused on response times. Yeah. They're really important, they affect outcomes, but if we focus all our energies there, we'll miss the opportunity to do the system change, which means using resources better, giving better outcomes, getting people to the right place at the right time, working as a whole system. That's the first thing. The second thing we need to do is work with the workforce to work differently, and that means work with the workforce we need to work with the people that do the care yeah. and the people that work around the needs of individual patients to allow them to get used to working together differently and the third bit we need to do is look at how we enable that with technology and the question that you asked is how far are we there we're some other way there mm. but that is not where the drive and energy is and we need people to understand in leadership positions that that requires significant investment uh, to allow us to make the progress that we need to on all of those three fronts. So what do emergency services actually need to do to be more connected? I guess, what are the, what are the next steps? Emergency services is, uh, is, is one of those titles. I'm sure there's a statutory definition of what emergency service is, but it's true that there's a group of blue light and other services who meet the needs of people in unscheduled, urgent and emergency care settings. Uh, some of them wear a blue uniform, some of them wear green uniform, some of them wear red jumpsuits. Uh, but connecting, for me, means that we're able to get people working together to deliver care. And examples of that are, at a very simple level in my profession, getting paramedic mentors and supervisors at the side of as many junior and new staff as possible to support them with their decision making, help share the load um, and help develop them. It means for me that, and I know that the politics and sensitivities around it, but I've met many firefighters who feel that they would like to be able to go out and do CPR on someone who's suffering a cardiac arrest or pick mm -hmm. old people up off the floor as part of their contribution. But they're also worried about what they don't know because they're not healthcare professionals. Same is true for community first responders, volunteer responders. Again, with the power of technology, we could put an experienced senior clinician next to them to help them make good and safe decisions. Um, the same is true in maternity emergencies. I mentioned it at the beginning of our conversation. I did say we come back to you that, know, didn't uh, I? <laughs> I, I? I don't need to be scrabbling around when I'm, you know, with a mum who's got a complicated birth, and I, you know, I don't need to. I don't need to describe it for you, but it's tricky in every sense. Uh, I need to be able to kind of press a button saying, I need a midwife <laughs> or an obstetrician to say, to just remind me what to do. Because somewhere in the back of my mind, the you training... You someone in your ear mm -hmm. who can see what you can see. Exactly. Just saying, right, yeah. you've been training this before, but here's a recap. Yeah. That was great. That was perfect. Now do it. Just, just be there if you, to guide you. You know, even if you practice mm. these things every six months, which you don't, it's yeah. every year or so, yeah. you know, you need some, some help and guidance. If it's, you know, it's connecting me together with, you know, a, a, you know, cardiologist because you've got, uh, you've got someone who's young and they fainted and 
you think they might have long QT, but you just can't remember can enough just about it. They can a glance it, at that know? ECG yeah. and they can say, put your mind at ease. It, exactly. Or actually say, yes, you need to do yeah. this, that or the other. But and most, it's, not, it's not rocket science, no, is it? Not. Like, te- but, the technology required, we, we have it, it's being used, it's straightforward, no, right. and it's not that expensive. But these are the most simple examples where we can mm. add the most value is managing people with complex comorbidities, long-term conditions, often experiencing frailty, often having that exacerbation at night time at the weekend, who f- there is only one route mm. for them, and that's hospital. But if we could connect them into the system, have a multi-professional conversation, agree a treatment plan, prescribe some medicines. Remember, you know, not all paramedics are independent prescribers. Yeah. We could set up an infusion plan. We could arrange for a nurse to come. We could give them home monitoring. Uh, and if they deteriorate, they don't even have to call for an ambulance themselves. Mm. They, we, it's that. called for them. Yeah. That's got to be the future so that we can keep as many people as safe and where they need to be as possible. Um, the, the, the future is, uh, is, the potential future is trying to do what we've always done the same. And that clearly isn't right. Um, we have to do things differently. And then the final thing I wanted to ask you about is further afield, beyond the UK, in the US, for example. Um, are you aware of the ways in which technology and digital is being utilised in pre-hospital care and emergency care? globally. But um, I've done ambulance shifts in Miami, for example, and uh, one thing's for sure is the ambulances are bigger (laughs) and noisier with louder sirens. They even use different tech with their sirens, you you know, to to deal with stuff. So I I know um, in the US that that the the pandemic has altered the way people want to work. I mean, it used to be the case we'd laugh when we worked with um, with paramedics from, from the US that when they got to a hospital, there was a dedicated EMS room which had free sandwiches and free drink and great coffee because they wanted the business. Yeah. There wasn't the, yeah. the experience that you have, dare I say it, here in the UK where people look at you as the lowest form of life because you've brought yet another person to their busy yeah. department. When I've done shifts out there over the years, it's like, hi, welcome, you know, come to our, to our room. But so the, the pandemic for them did change it because they did want to reduce nosocomial infection rates and they did want to, you know, so prevent it. For the first time it. ever, they the didn't want ever. the ambulance turning Correct, into their door. Correct, yeah. yeah. And actually they did want to activate alternative pathways and stuff. So I know that that conversation's happening. I know that tech has been used um, for example, in stroke care, particularly because, you know, we, we remember our geography here, but in the US they have huge geography. Yeah. And actually, mm-hmm. if you want someone to go to a comprehensive stroke center and get you know, thrombectomy, actually flying, flying them in a helicopter for 300 miles, um, you need to make sure that that's the right investment because yeah. it's not just expensive and has risk. It means that they're 300 miles away you from their family. You need a stroke consultant to it be making that decision. Money. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. needs to be a collective decision. Um, I think that... We also have to remember that there isn't a single unified way of being EMS. We've got a paramedic profession here. We've got some pre-hospital emergency medicine working in critical care. And we've got some some doctors who do some kind of primary and unscheduled urgent care. But predominantly, the EMS system in the UK is a paramedic-led system. And the same is true in Australia, New Zealand, um, and in the US. They call it the Anglo-American or Anglo-Australasian model of having paramedics but just over the other side of the channel um, it's a different model um, there are some paramedics in Poland and in other countries but often it's a it's a very different model with volunteers or ambulance nurses and having you know docs working um, either on ambulances or providing remote support and so that's why actually connected EMS systems um, will be different in each country. And, uh, and if I think about the work that I've been doing with stroke over the years, uh, with colleagues from the US and, and around Europe, actually, uh, the, you know, particularly where there's rurality involved, being able to put those more senior clinicians and those ambulance doctors or their stroke lead at the side of, of a non-registrant, non-qualified ambulance crew, first yeah. aid type yeah. crew, I mean, I, not being rude, it's just different models, Um, that could help to lift the consistency and quality of care. So I think we need to remember that not every country has the same system, has Mm. the same developed status of EMS systems, 
um, or indeed the same geography. But there's no doubt by connecting people together with people with expertise, with people with generalist knowledge, people with system knowledge, being able to present information, statuses of services together and support practice, you can increase the quality and safety of care. Absolutely, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your expertise, your nice wisdom, to, and yes. being so honest as well, I think, with us today. I think, you know, that was just, a, for me, a really interesting um, eye-opening chat with, I think, some hope as well that things can improve in the future. Yeah, I, I, think, they, I think they definitely can. I think we need to create a consensus of, of opinion that we need to change things. And I think if we start... Oddly, because I normally say we should start focused on the patient. I think if, certainly in ambulance land, we say we start focused on supporting the paramedic yeah. and the other staff mm -hmm. by bringing their support and supervision yeah. together and making it a safer place to practice, yeah. that would be a great place to start. And that would be a great thing for the patient as it well. Would, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, thanks, David. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can find the full show notes and links in the podcast description. David, thanks again for being with us and joining us and sharing your experience and insights. And thank you to Visionable for facilitating this conversation. It's been really fascinating to hear about the urgent need to leverage digital to transform emergency care. Visionable's Connected Emergency Services is paving the way in this area, enabling faster diagnosis and treatment by bringing in the right people and information at the optimum time, regardless of location. To find out more about connected emergency services, please visit visionable.com forward slash emergency services. 